And when I tell you what it was, you will have the same thought as I did when I looked at it tonight with my children, which was, what the hell were you thinking? The shell suit. <laughs> the shell suit. At some point, mid 1986, 87, some fashion designer thought, you know what, those tracksuits made out of nice, comfortable cotton, far too practical. Let's make them out of the most static inducing, sweaty material known to man, nylon, and then let's make them in the most lurid and vulgar, luminous colours we can. And not just one, we'll put lots of colours on them as well. Oh my god, I begged and I pleaded for a shell suit. And do you know what mine looked like? It was green paisley. <laughs> I had the only green paisley shell suit in Sully Hall and no friends. But what's worse is, what's worse is his and hers shell suits. Did you know it? Be honest, if you're old enough to have owned one, did you and the wife had a matching shell suit? No one's going to own up to that, are they? I'll tell you a story, right? I have a friend who's a captain for an airline. And about 1989, he'd had enough of shelter to be bored to the back seat of people going off on holidays. We'll go in the shell suit, because it's like, we packed small. We'll go in the shell suit, it's packed tonight. And he had enough. And one day, he could see rows and rows of shell suits waiting to board an aircraft, children, kids, grandparents. Yeah. And he contacted the grand crew at the top of the gate and said, I don't know. He said, just work with me on this. And he walked out. Tap the microphone. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, hello, it's your captain speaking. I'm terribly sorry, we've had a massive computer failure, and we have no details of the seat allocation for the flight. We don't know what to do, there's no protocol for this. I'm going to make an executive decision. We're going to board the aeroplane this afternoon by shell suit cover. <laughs> 275 people going, but I won't be next to my wife when I'm in four colours out. Is that what he just walked off laughing? Absolutely true story. Anyway, let me tell you a bit about myself. Um, I am a children's entertainer full time. Um, I've been a kids' entertainer for 10 years. I perform as the formal Monty Jester. And for those of you old enough, yes, that was a play on words that I chose deliberately. I am a jester. Uh, I actually started as a clown when I was 20 years old in Spain. I was working in a resort one day, not to be stereotypical, but the kids' entertainer, who was also the resident drunk, was swimming in a bath of vodka and didn't turn up for the mini disco. And I got tap on the shoulder, you, you'll do, go! Here's a hundred potatoes, and for the millennials, that's euros in Spanish. <laughs> so go buy a costume, I'll buy a costume. And what I didn't know then, but I know now, is when I put clown makeup on, you know, the wig and the white face and the colourful clothes, I could scare Pennywise from it. <laughs> I am terrifying. I walked out to that resort, all happy and jolly, and voila! All the kids went, Wah! went the opposite direction, so that was the first and last time I ever dressed as a clown. So when I decided to do it full time, I thought, yes, that's, that's a much better idea. And it did lead to some interesting phone calls and, and conversations on doorsteps. There was one gig that my wife put for me. She said, I've got a lovely lady phone up. She wants to book you eight o'clock on Saturday. She's absolutely adamant. She wants the full Monty. That's great. Can you go? I walked up the door, knocked on the door. Hello, I'm the full Monty. She said, great, show me a one. But I pulled out a small black and white thing. She went, no, not that one, big boy. Oh, you've got the wrong idea. I don't know any of this. Nobody wants to see that, darling. Um, but, you know, I, I've been a kids entertainer ever since. And you do have some strange kids. It's nice tonight to be in a room of people who aren't wetting themselves or throwing up or calling for mommy. That, that makes a change, I'll be honest. Um, and I'm a dad. And I'm very proud to be a dad of two kids. Um, something else that happened in 1988 actually came back to haunt me when I had children. 1988, I thought called Rain Man came out. Does anyone remember Rain Man? Really touching tale about autism. 1988, that came out. When my kids were born, at three and four years old respectively, they were diagnosed as autism, with, uh, with autism, and that was my frame of reference. So instantly, I was rubbing my hands together, thinking, brilliant! We're going to make a fortune, they're going to count cards in casinos, when they're going to have to work again, they're going to be geniuses, won't go to school. Apart from they don't have that kind of autism, they have something called Asperger's, which means they have the socially awkward looking at the floor, can't hold a conversation kind of autism. So that plan sort of backfired. But they have given us some wonderful highlights, and, and, and I'll leave you with two things. My youngest, when he was about two and a half, three, um, used to have it like to dip his finger into my wife's white wine at dinner time. Now, my wife would always have a glass of a bottle of wine every night. We had two under fours. Bear with us. Um, 
And, and once a week, we make the regular pilgrimage to Aldi to go and choose the wine, because, you know, don't make wine type of bit. One day, we're in Aldi, we're choosing the wine, the wife and I looking this way at the wine rack, Dominic stood up in the trolley, and we just hear, clink, clink. We turn around, and there's Dominic holding the bottle of white wine aloft like it's a scandal. <laughs> and we turn and look at him, and he looks at us, looks around the supermarket, and in a big loud voice says, I like wine! <laughs> we didn't know whether to be proud or devastated, at which point the inevitable happened, he was only three, it was a heavy bottle, and he slipped out of his fingers and smashed on the floor, wine and glass everywhere. A shop assistant scurries over, it's okay little man, are you okay, don't worry, is everything alright, are you okay? And he looked us square in the eyes and went, no, it was a bloody Chardonnay! My oldest lad, when he was six, got absolutely obsessed with all things superheroes, like most kids do. And um, one Christmas, six years old, Spider-Man was in. Everything had to be Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Pajamas, bedclothes, toys, and all he wanted was this Spider-Man action figure. Now, any parents of my age who are mid-40s and a bit younger or a bit older will know that in the past ten years, toy makers have got malicious. What they do is they they secure toys into their boxes with these twisty tie things. Has anyone seen them? You can't get them off for love the money. You need bolt cutters or wire cutters. Christmas morning, my son is there. He opens what he knows is the action toy. He grabs the box with one hand, grabs Spider Man with the other hand, and it doesn't budge. And if you've ever upset an autistic child, it goes from zero to <laughs> really fast. Full on meltdown. I went into action stations with my wife. I dropped to my knees. I'm there, I'm pulling at the box, I'm trying to do everything I can to get the wire cut to that, get these twisty ties off. My wife diverts him, she puts the film on, she puts him in his new Spider-Man pajamas, we're winning. Five minutes later, sweat pouring off me, looking like a bit of a lunatic. I hold up Spider-Man. I look at my son, I go, Oscar, I've done it! He presses pause on the DVD remote, looks at me, and says, Dad, you look just like the Green Goblin. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gents, it's been an absolute pleasure. Have the rest of a lovely evening. Thank you very much. Good night.